So Castro had come out with a very damning indictment and he said that he compared NATO to the Nazis and slammed the Americans and the Israelis for creating ISIS. And there is enough uh, evidence for that. Then you had the US uh, General McCurney, and we have the video, we'll show it to you later. He said, we helped create the ISIS. This year we had a very important report that was released to the media. None of them carried it here. But the US Defense Intelligence Agency, which is part of the Pentagon, came out with a report saying that we foresaw the rise of the ISIS way back in 2002 and the creation of a Salafist principality in Syria. This was within their understanding, within their domain, way back in 2012. And basically saying that the overwhelming core of the Syrian insurgency at the time was dominated by a range of Islamist militant groups, including the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So they knew who they were helping, who, who they were supplying the weapons to. This information was with them. Now, how far this conflict goes? Does it go to 2011 when there was a democratic uprising, or do the plans for Syria go back far more, deeper? Julian Assange quotes weekly cables which of 2006, which basically say that the roots for the regime change agenda in Syria go back to 2006. And 
they were going to use the Sunni Shiite uh, fault lines to get that agenda in place. It was way back in 2009 that Roland Dumas, ex-foreign minister of France, we have the video again, where he came across his British counterparts who told him that we are preparing to send British forces into Syria to bring about regime change. So what exactly is happening out here? Okay, then we have a United Nations report which says that Israel is supporting the ISIS. Now what is Israel supporting the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State of Syria and Levant or Iraq for? Okay, now this is a United Nations UNDOF report of 12 pages. Charles Lister was another strategy expert and he said that the Syrian insurgency was basically being coordinated with the Al-Qaeda. We knew it was the Al-Qaeda and from 2012 onwards, we have, uh, the CIA was coordinating with them. Now we'll come to the key reasons why we have this problem. We'll just go through this map first. It's necessary to understand this map and then we go to the four reasons for this problem. For India, it's important because the flames have come to Pakistan, as you all know, and all the way to Palestine and to Libya, and it goes down now into Nigeria and Kenya. It is just spreading and it goes all the way to Ukraine. It's actually under there. Okay, fine. Can we give him a handle mic? No, no, no. Give a pointer. The main battles, of course, concentrated in Syria, Iraq. These are the two main battles. Three for Lebanon, Europe, Palestine is under tension, Jordan, Turkey, Iran, Oman, Yemen, below. All these countries are involved in the Central War. Now, there are four reasons mainly for this entire war that is happening. <coughs> the first reasons are the ones that we know of. is the question of the pipelines, the question of the oil reserves, in 2006-07, major oil reserves have been found in the eastern Mediterranean, in the coastlines of Syria, Cyprus, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine. All these countries stand to gain from the oil and gas reserves found in the eastern Mediterranean. So it's a matter of who controls the oil, who, who sits in Damascus, is the question. That is one issue. The second point being, is the battle over two pipelines? There are two pipelines battling it out for supplying the gas to Europe. One is the Iran, Iraq, Syria pipeline going via Turkey to Europe and the other is the Qatar, Saudi pipeline going via Syria to Europe. These are the two pipelines that are battling it out. And Qatar offered uh, Syria that option that you step out of the Iran axis, you come along with us and uh, be part of the new alliance with NATO, actually. Assad refused. Uh, and so in 2006, actually the turning point which WikiLeaks traced goes back to 2006. In the month of July 11th, when Israel attacked Lebanon, after a 34-day war, the Lebanese resistance led by the Hezbollah and by the communist and the nationalist forces of uh, uh, Lebanon they managed to defeat the Israelis by stopping them at the border. Go back to 1967 when the Arab armies were defeated in six days and Arab capitals were taken over. But after a 34 day war, a 20,000 strong uh, Israeli army with tanks and fighter planes and navy, they could not defeat the Hezbollah. So in 2006, you have a clear alliance between the Israelis and the Saudis happening and very openly. And this is spelled out in an article which I'll come to by Samor Hirsch. So one was the oil and the gas issue, the battle of the pipelines which you can see. Uh, I'll come to this map as well. Uh, the point was that 
after the war of 2006, Syria was given certain options by the West. This very Bashar al-Assad was invited to Paris as a liberal reformist. He was the chief guest at the French Republic Day. Okay, thank you. 2007, Bashar al-Assad was invited to the French Republic Day as a chief guest. And there he was given the option of becoming part of the Qatari Saudi pipeline. The sanctions on Syria would end. But Syria would have to not only become part of the pipeline, but stop supporting the Palestinian resistance. In that, even Israel would hand over Golan Heights to Syria. To that extent, the discussions were taking place. Assad refused. Assad refused and said that I cannot abandon the Palestinian resistance, nor can I abandon my old allies, be it Iran or Russia for the matter. Okay. This map is of course very interesting, we will come to it, but it is about the oil smuggling that is taking place from Syria and Iraq, it goes to Turkey and from the port of Seyan it goes to Israel. So the Deir Azor is the main place where the oil from Syria is being siphoned out by the ISIS. Then you have the same thing happening in Iraq and from there it's going all the way into Turkey and from there to Israel. Of course, there are buyers in Europe and America and so on and uh, so forth, but uh, this is how the entire ISIS uh, terror factory is being uh, funded. So there's an important article on this. I'll, I think this information can be sent out to people over here. But now there is the other pipeline battle taking place in Europe in Eastern Europe between the Russians and NATO on the other hand, but it is the crisis of Ukraine. So the crisis of Ukraine emerged in 2014 and where, Amer uh, where the isolation of Putin was put into place, sanction on Russia, so that uh, the Russian uh, pipelines from the south, the, the Russians were trying to build a pipeline one is which one that goes to Germany, but they wanted one down from south, so they would stop depending on the, the key NATO countries. But that was when the entire Ukrainian uh, crisis emerged. The point being that if the point being that if the Iranian reserves which have been released now after the uh, sanctions on Iran on the nuclear deal and the Russians get together, they control 50% of the gas supplies to Europe. And the Americans are trying to stop all that they can in terms of at least neutralizing uh, the Russian supplies to Europe. Okay. Uh, the oil, the pipelines, but that is not the entire story. The largest story is about the Israeli plan for the region. The Israeli plan is for a greater Israel. It is Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates. And here you have this discussed openly in the media now. And we had what was called the Oded Yunon plan of 1982, an open document. It's not a, you know, a hidden document. This was a public document released by the Israelis in 1982, where the greater Israel project was discussed where the final solution for them was the total ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population and the spread of Israeli power from the Nile in Egypt to the Euphrates in Iraq and the ethnic cleansing of the various communities from these areas. The second document which must be read is called A Clean Break Strategy for Securing the Realm by Benjamin Netanyahu. This again says that Oslo was a defeat for Zionism and the peace plan cannot be adhered to. What Israel needs to do is reorganize the map of the region. Just imagine what they're saying. And what it meant was essentially partitioning Arab and Muslim countries along the various religious, ethnic and sectarian fault lines. It could be a Christian Muslim division in Egypt. It would be a Kurdish Arab division in Iraq. It could be a Sunni Shia division in Iraq and Syria, but all the basic fault lines that existed needed to be hit on and these countries partitioned and divided. And the third important document is 
what is called the project for the new American century, again released in 97, which says that there's no power that exists now, that America is the only superpower, the 21st century will be the American century. And it lays down a blueprint about how America would be the hegemonic power, which they call total global dominance in the 21st century. This is the map of Greater Israel, stretching all the way from Egypt to Iraq and Syria. And that is why you see the larger war that is again occurring in this region. After 9-11, uh, General Wesley Clark, that video is again there with us, said that there was a memo in the White House that said that after 9-11, seven countries had to be taken out in five years. And those countries were Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Lebanon, Sudan, and ending with Iran. Iraq is in a state of disarray. It's, it's a collapsed state. Libya is now partitioned with Al-Qaeda and ISIS holding towns and cities. Somalia with, with, uh, with again a, you know, a failed state. Syria is facing a war. A lot, large part of the country has been destroyed. Lebanon is just holding on. It could deteriorate into a civil war. Sudan has been partitioned. And Iran, uh, for now, is surrounded and facing war if the Israelis would have the way, and the Saudis as well. And in that context, there's a very important article which appeared in 2007, by, written by Samora as a Pulitzer, uh, uh, Pulitzer winner. It's a very prophetic article. It should be read by all of us, the ones who are concerned with West Asia and understanding it better. That article calls it, uh, it's about the redirection of American foreign policy. Way back in 2007, Semoros writes that now American foreign policy will be redirected with the Bush administration and will carry on with the coming administrations. And it basically talks of creating a Saudi-Turkish-Israeli bloc against the arc of the resistance. They like to call it the Shiite arc, but I refuse to call it that because I basically call it the arc of the resistance against the colonial collaborator vassal states. So, because the attack, the war on Iraq finally changed the balance of power, which they did not intend to, but anybody who could have gone into Iraq could have foreseen that finally it would have changed the balance of power. Now, Saddam, as a secular dictator, did a lot of good things for that country. But at the same time, the biggest mess that he created for the region was Saddam's war on Iran. He ruined Iraq. And Iraq could not stand up after that disastrous war on Iran. The Iran could stand up, but Iraq carried on to collapse within, with the UN sanctions, with the divisions within, and all that happened. And finally, uh, Iraq was too weak to uh, take on the the war that the Americans launched for them in 2003. And again, be it the war of 1991, when uh, Iraq was invaded uh, for the first time by Bush Sr., Syria was the only Arab country that did not take part in that war. And again in 2003, when the Arab alliance along with NATO invaded Iraq, Syria was not part of that war. So there has been something to do with Syria in terms of standing with the resistance and not getting enmeshed in the NATO agenda for the region. So this article by Semorosh is very important uh, to be read. It starts with, of course, in Tunisia, and Tunisia is the only country that has been able to deal with the situation in a, in a political way, because there is a balance that the secular and the centrist forces and in the Islamists have tried to negotiate and try to move towards a parliamentary democracy. Even the constitution is progressive, in terms of equal rights for citizens and women's rights, workers' rights, it's, it's largely a progressive document as far as the Arab world is concerned. It's, it's, it's actually a, it's quite a good constitution. But the other countries have not been able to deal with it. Now, it, the next theater of war we saw so, was in Libya, where we had this entire anti-Gaddafi propaganda. Again, I say that Gaddafi was a, a dictator, undoubtedly. But at the same time, Libya was a very advanced welfare state. 
uh, it was on par with any country in Europe in terms of what was being done for the people with the old resources. It was Gaddafi who was instrumental for the creation of the African Union. And 90% of the oil that was even pumped out by the multinationals was actually owned by the Libyan state. The Libyan state actually controlled 90% of the oil reserves, which the Western powers really did not like. And most of the oil wealth was going to his people. The other thing that Gaddafi was moving towards was the creation of an African currency, uh, a common uh, African currency in the, in, uh, denominated with, with a gold standard. This was finally the key to finishing of Gaddafi, the entire propaganda against Gaddafi, and then where China and Russia actually made a mess by not vetoing the Americans in the United Nations Security Council, where the uh, no-fly zone was allowed, and then Al-Qaeda and ISIS were actually sent into uh, Libya. You will see photographs of the leader of Al-Qaeda with John McCain uh, in this uh, lecture. So after Libya was destroyed, from that theater of war, Al-Qaeda and ISIS were airlifted into Turkey. Weapons from Libya were airlifted to Turkey. Turkey became the main base of operations. Then came NATO weapons from Zagreb in Croatia. And from Turkey, this entire war began to spill over into Syria. But this was way back before the initial demonstrations also began in Syria. And uh, we'll, we'll come to Syria in that context. As far as Syria is concerned, undoubtedly it is, uh, it was, because now certain changes are coming to the constitution where the Ba'ath party cannot monopolize power anymore. It was essentially a one party system where smaller parties would be there, the communist party, the socialist party and so on and so forth. But essentially the Ba'ath socialist party controlled the Syrian state, but they had roots amongst the people. But yet it was uh, quite a repressive state. I've met friends in Syria who became friends later who were part of the initial demonstrations in Dara because the, the, the demonstrations didn't begin in the south of Syria. Those very people who were part of the demonstrations said, yes, yes, we want the rights that you have in India, the right to protest, the right to dissent, the free media, and the other things that go in, into a liberal progressive constitution. We don't have that right now. But we don't want foreign mercenaries. We don't want this country to be converted into an Islamic state. We want a secular Syria. That was what Muslim friends in Syria were telling me. Of course, the minorities don't want an Islamic state. But there were friends from the majority Sunni community who said that we did not bargain for this kind of a scenario where we have mercenaries from the world pouring into a country and the role that Qatar and Kuwait and Saudi and Turkey are playing in terms of destroying our, our culture and our civilization. Oops, okay. Now the point is that in Syria, one is the Syrian army and the other is the police called the Mukbarat. The police always the more repressive force. So when the initial demonstration did take place, the police did hit upon the people. At the same time, from my our own understanding and speaking to friends in various parts of the Arab world, that Assad at the same time understood that the need for reform had come, that they could not suppress the entire uh, upsurge of the people and that reforms were necessary. In 2011 itself, they sat down with the parliamentary opposition and they went towards reforming the constitution. They went through a process of a one-year reform of the constitution, which was finally put to a referendum in 2012. In 2012, 56% of the people came out to vote, even in this kind of a scenario. That constitution has some problems, because the problem with most Muslim countries, especially in that part of the world, is that the constitution says that the prime minister or the president of the country can only be a Muslim. So Syria being a secular country, but because of the pressure of the Islamists, especially of the Muslim Brotherhood, the constitution still says that the top post of this country can only be a Muslim. And actually it goes on to say Sunni Muslim. That is how, uh, you know, the, the problems of uh, political Islam manifesting themselves in the constitution of the region where equal rights are not, uh, uh, not given to the, the minorities. So from 2012, you had this scenario. The referendum took place. 56% of the people voted. 
but not a line in any newspaper of the world. In Yemen, you had an election with only one person standing and it was declared a democratic election. In Ukraine, half the country was at war. They had an election that was a successful election. But in Syria, you had a referendum and an election in 2014. And in that election of 2014, 25 of us from across the world were there. We traveled to cities under siege and under war. And yet, 73% of the people voted. And 88% people voted for Assad because uh, as of now, he's a unifying force. Uh, Kerry and Obama and the Saudis and all keep on saying that Assad must go. But finally, it is for the people of Syria to decide who has to stay and who has to go. Okay. And then came out this entire thing of moderate rebels and extremist rebels, ISIS. And in fact, Al-Qaeda was called moderate compared to ISIS. The Free Syrian Army was supposed to be the moderate force. So what is this Free Syrian Army? The Free Syrian Army is the conduit for the supply of weapons to the Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda. The Jabhat al-Nusra is the Al-Qaeda of Syria. Officially, they call themselves that. But the CNN, the BBC, the Al Jazeera, or even our papers anymore, do not refer to the Jabhat al-Nusra Al-Qaeda as a terrorist organization. We've also started calling ISIS as militants now. That is the way they're trying to change the, you know, the, the language around these organizations. So the Americans this time did not create their own organization because they know that, again, it will go into some other direction. But they use the Free Syrian Army as the conduit for the supply of weapons, chemical weapons, or what have you. And that is why what they've done is that the kind of, uh, you know, the network that they built up post-1979 in the aftermath of the Afghan Jihad, they've carried on to build up that network across the world. Mercenaries, militants, jihadists from more than 100 countries are active in Syria. 80% of those fighting in Syria are foreigners. 20% are Syrian. Though in Iraq it's a different situation, we'll discuss Iraq, but because, you know, uh, the Syrian situation in Syria after the Russian intervention, a lot of things have begun to change. And uh, the tide is turning in our favor, the global tide. This is General McCurney on TV saying that we helped build ISIS. Now coming to Mr. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Caliph of the world, where did he come from? Okay. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was basically Al-Qaeda in Iraq, imprisoned by the Americans in the Bukha prison of Iraq. And finally, in 2013 and 14, ISIS was created around Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So the entire team of ISIS was in the American Bukka prison in Iraq. This team was created and then let out, through which ISIS was created in Iraq. But with a combination of two forces, one was the Salafi Wahhabists, linked to Saudi Arabia, and then the Ba'athists. So the Ba'athists who hated Saudis, finally you had this alliance. So you have ISIS in which you have Ba'athist elements, but they are the weaker elements, though the, uh, because they are the remnants of the Saddam army, so they are better fighters. But at the same time, ideologically, the Ba'athists are still secular, and the Wahhabi Salafi elements want to create an Islamic state where no Kafirs are supposed to be living there, or if they are living then as third-grade third grade citizens. Now you have this statement by the Israeli ambassador to, the, to America, Michael Oren, and there's one important writer called Robert Perry. You all should read him, he's good. In there, Michael Oren clearly states that we should use the Al-Qaeda in Syria to basically weaken the Syrian government, work at regime change, and ensure that Hezbollah is destroyed. And to that extent, that support the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda to go into Lebanon as well so that you can destroy the resistance in the region. That's Michael Oren. I've got a lot of, uh, you know, sources from what appeared in the New York Times, from PBS, from CBS, from various, from the Haaretz, from the Independent, the Guardian, where they clearly articulated as to what was happening. Like, for example, way back in 2014, they speak of the training of all these forces in the bases in Qatar. Then, 
the ISIS, the Jabal al Nusra, the Free Syrian Army, actually working in, in what is called the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights are Syrian occupied territory. I mean, it is Syrian territory occupied by the Israelis. And it is from the Golan Heights where the Israelis are providing protection, hospitals, weapon supply to these forces. One very important role is the role of Senator John McCain, and he's not a small fry, uh, one of the main faces of the Republican Party. He fought against Obama in 2008. Senator Obama, uh, so, uh, Senator John McCain, has played a very disruptive role in Ukraine, to Libya, to Syria. All, he's all over the place. And prior to the, yeah, okay, this is a photograph of, this is a photograph of John McCain and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This was in 2013. At that time, there was already a $10 million uh, prize on Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi because he was al-Qaeda. And then you have Belhaj, the leader of the al-Qaeda in Libya, posing with John McCain. This is how all openly it is being done. Okay. And we came across a new word in these, in these last few years. It's called non-lethal aid. Now, what is non-lethal aid? Non-lethal aid means Humvees and Toyota pickup trucks being supplied to these, the, uh, these characters. This is called non-lethal aid. $250 million announced and it, uh, the, the event ahead. Non-lethal aid. OK, now. This is the leader of the Free Syrian Army, General Okeli, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This is John McCain in Syria, in the north, in Idlib. He goes in from Turkey, goes to the north in Idlib, meets all these guys, and uh, he guarantees them uh, supplies of weapons and all the other equipment that they required. Now look at these, uh, the information that we can garner from the New York Times on 12. Three and a half months before the administration first around non-lethal aid to the opposition, a secret CIA-assisted airlift of arms to the rebels began by March 2013, would comprise 160 flights and estimated 3,500 tons of military equipment. The CIA helped Arab governments to shop for weapons and vetted rebel commanders, groups to determine who would receive the weapons. God knows who they were vetting because there's no one worth vetting out there. Wetting means that they'll be looking at who's the moderate rebel and who's the, the good guys and the bad guys, but where are the, you know. Yeah. Now, again, this, the New York Times reports that Turkey was helping the American allies in the region, which supplied Syrian rebel groups with automatic rifles, propelled grenades, ammunition, anti-tank weapons, and the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood was playing a very key role and was being paid for by Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So you have a lot of information from Western media sources in that period itself. I've done Israel links twice. This. Okay. The other problem was the kind of the way the ISIS and all these forces were actually behaving with the ethnic and religious minorities. For example, the ancient Assyrian Christian community of Iraq has been reduced from 1.2 million to about 300,000. They are just fleeing. They are either fleeing towards Lebanon or they are fleeing towards Europe. With the Yazidis that are 500,000, which we know, that community has been brutalized and large parts of the women have been taken into sexual slavery. They were also given the option of converting to Islam, and it was not that please convert to Islam. You have to convert to Islam, or you'll be beheaded, you'll be killed, or you'll be raped, or you'll be what will be done to you. Okay. So the problem was that this new kind of Salafist Wahhabi Islam, or also the Takfiri form of Islam, Takfir basically means that I am the only Muslim. The rest of you are not Muslims. All of you all are kafirs, and I have to either get you back to the faith or you are dead. So the initial SMSs that rotated in Syria said that Christians to Beirut and Alawites to the grave. That was what was being done. 
because after the Libyan victory, they thought it was a matter of three months in which they could wrap up the, Lebanese, uh, the Syrian, uh, you know, uh, like they could have taken Syria within a few months. So you had people being crucified, people being tortured, and the other problem which we uh, which we will discuss, but a lot of it was being done on the basis of hadith that were being quoted by them, that what we are doing here was was done, and we are, we are doing what we our Islamic teachings have told us to do. So there's a, no, no, that is the point, that is the point, Nurubai, that this entire battle now, the crisis of Islam, is that there are so many hadiths, purists and the right hadiths, that we need to stand up and say which is the right and which is the wrong. True, true, true, true. No, no. I agree with you, Nurubai. The problem is that they are basing their acts on the hadiths, not on the Quran. That has become the bigger problem. And there are a large section of Muslims who don't see the difference between the Quran and the Hadith anymore. They, are, they, they think it's on par. Okay? <coughs> okay. Now, I'd like you all to note one thing. There is a very important documentary that was made by Serena Shim, a Lebanese-American journalist. It's a 20-minute documentary on the operations of the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda from Turkey into Syria. It's a 20-minute documentary. Why it's important? Because she was murdered by Turkish intelligence in 2013. She paid for it with her life, but this document is very important. We don't have time to show it today, but uh, it's, uh, we'll send it to you all as part of... No, no, Serena Shame. Just dial Serena, you know, you'll get it. And what does she say in this documentary? And I've seen it. Openly, trucks are operating on the Turkish-Syrian border. Rows and rows of kilometers of trucks getting in weapons, food, oil, gas, logistics for the uh, mercenaries, militants, terrorists, what do you want to call them? It's operating from the Hatay province in southern Turkey. The Incirlik NATO base. Incirlik is the air base where the Americans operate from. So the weapons fly into the Incirlik base and the, the weapons are coming from Lib Libya and NATO base in Europe. And the weapons are carried into the camps in Rihani, Rihaniye and Chokoli, uh, Turkish friends who know where they are, and they were to be distributed and the money and the weapons is being controlled by the CI and the Mossad agents in these camps, not by the Free Syrian Army. So you have Scott Reichardt, who is ex-CIA, I have seen his interview, and he says very clearly that it is not the Free Syrian Army that controls the weapons and, uh, and the money. The training and everything has been done by CI and Mossad agents in these camps. Now this is a ISIS agent, ISIS uh, uh, terrorist being operated in a hospital in Turkey. You actually have ISIS t-shirts available in parts of Turkey. It has become that ridiculous. And these guys travel in Wearing ISIS t-shirts, they are travelling in Istanbul and Ankara. These are the Humvees. We will see another video on this. But these Humvees travel between Mosul in Iraq to Raqqa in Syria, across 800 kilometers of desert, open flatland, and the Americans don't know what's happening. It's ridiculous, actually. Okay? This is how ridiculous this entire operation. They, they supply these Toyota armies to them. You can see they're all the same make, same color. It's not some, you know, hotspots thing. They've been supplied thousands and thousands of these Humvees uh, to travel across Iraq and Syria. You actually have them ha having access to Scud missiles, to major advanced weapons, tanks. So the ISIS is not merely a terrorist organization, it's a terrorist army controlling a state. It has a capital in Raqqa, it has a capital in Mosul. This is what we are up against in this world. Things are changing on the ground, but the point is that how did they get hold of these weapons? They got, got hold, we are told, is when the Iraqi army retreated in Mosul and they could get their hands on these weapons. When they got their hands on these weapons, the Americans did not attack them, and that is standard operating procedure for the Americans, that if our 
weapons are going to go to the hands of the enemy, we should destroy them. And at the same time, America was droning Yemen, America was droning into Pakistan, Afghanistan, that is all routine, but no drones or no aerial attacks in Iraq to counter the ISIS. This is Lindsey Graham. He talks of the coming 9-11 attack. This is a kind of fear-mongering. This is a very Lindsey Graham who's in a photograph with Bell Hajj next to John McCain. So they meet terrorists, they create terror gangs, and then they warn people about the coming 9-11 attack. And why is he doing it? Why is he doing it? Basically, there is the Republican lobby uh, and even elements within the Democratic Party who wanted boots on the ground. And that is where we need to discuss in the refugee issue. Why is the refugee issue actually being created? Okay. So the John McCain lobby linked to the Israelis, they basically wanted boots on the ground where Americans would form 10% of the boots on the ground, but then you would have Turkish troops and you would have troops from the Arab League. Now, how were they going to manage it? They were going to manage it in the same way that they managed Libya. And that is why you had... In 2013, the entire chemical weapons attack story in Gotha, in the suburb of Damascus. So the Syrian government invites the United Nations delegation to come to Syria. The day they land in Damascus, you have a chemical weapons attack in the suburbs of Damascus. Within half an hour, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, Assad has crossed the red line, now we must go and attack Syria. Now, there's a remarkable lady in, in uh, Syria. Her name is Mother Agnes Mariam of the Cross. She's a remarkable lady. She's a Lebanese Palestinian nun. She lives in Lebanon, but she, she went with a little team into this area in that war zone, and she did a fact-finding report on that. You will not believe what was happening. The photographs of the children that we saw who had been victims of the chemical weapons attack were children who were kidnapped by the rebels. Because when they were shown on TV, Mother Agnes, who does a lot of work amongst the communities over there, she and her friends began to get calls that we can see our children over there and they've been kidnapped. So they began to track the families of these children. They were mainly Alawite children, by the way. But those children who were being kidnapped by the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda were then, chemical weapons were being used on them. Those very photographs were being released to the world and an entire hysteria being, that was created. Recently, one Turkish member of parliament has come out with the entire story where he said that the sarin chemical weapons gas has been supplied to the ISIS via Turkey through Turkish intelligence. Two important journalists, very senior journalists in Turkey, who are behind bars for 45 years, they say, for actually revealing the role of Erdogan's government and Turkish intelligence in this entire sordid episode. So the agenda was that you shout chemical weapons, you go to the United States Security Council or not, you announce a no-fly zone, and then you send in the ISIS and Al-Qaeda that they did in Libya, but it failed. It failed because this report of Mother Agnes went to Sergei Lavrov in Russia. The Russians placed it in the United Nations Security Council, and they exposed the hand of the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Turks in this entire operation. Obama had to back out. And Putin gave him a respectful way, OK, you don't attack, you can't attack, we will get Assad to give all his chemical weapons up to the, uh, to the United Nations. That was what actually happened in 2013. And the refugee issue, what is the Turkish agenda? The Turkish agenda is actually to capture the northern territories of Syria that they can take. Everybody is out for a grab. The Israelis want to take over Golan. They've actually given out oil contracts to Dick Cheney's company to dig, uh, to oil, drill oil in the, in the Golanites, which is actually Syrian territory. In the north, you have the Turks trying to capture uh, territory from Syria and even into Iraq. Turkey uh, recently sent an entire, you know, thousand soldiers into Mosul to fight ISIS when they're supporting ISIS. So everybody is supposedly fighting terror, but out for their own uh, land and uh, resource grabs also. The photograph of that boy, that Kurdish boy, Elan Kurdi, right? In the last four years, you, we, we've, I've never heard of Libyan refugees and Syrian refugees in my life. The only Syrian migrant we know of is Steve Jobs, but we never heard of Libyan and Syrian refugees. In the last four years, you have Somali, Libyan, Ethiopian, all kinds of 
children drowning in the seas of the Mediterranean, trying to get to Spain and Italy. We never saw a photograph. All of a sudden, we saw a photograph of Ailan Kurdi on the beaches of Greece. The Lemon newspaper of, Pal uh, of Paris brought out the entire expose. We all got taken in, you know, emotions and we were all very sad. Of course, the child did die. The child was lying on a different part of the beach, a very rocky part of the beach. He was shifted to the sandy part of the beach and his photograph was taken. Levant actually published all those photographs. Then Erdogan raised the issue that Syria Assad is responsible for the refugees. The refugees were being facilitated by a CNN report that they were be being put into buses in towns. Police were guarding those buses. They were taken to the Turkish port of Izmir and seven kilometers across there to the port of Greece. It was all being done openly. There are, uh, the entire Turkish police and the intelligence was, uh, was involved in this operation, along with the smugglers. Everybody was making a lot of money out of it. So these refugees start flowing into Europe. And then starts the cry that the refugees are coming because Assad is killing them. Now what is the demographic situation within Syria? It's a population of 23 million people, a little more than Bombay, a little less than Delhi. Out of these 23 million people, 4 million are refugees. That leaves 19 million people. With the 19 million people, half the population within Syria is displaced. Internally displaced people, as they're called. Where are the majority of the people within Syria staying? 80% at least, if not more. Some people say 90%. But 80% of the Syrian population moves to government-held areas. They're staying in Damascus, they're staying in Latakia, Tartus, mainly on the, where they're safe with the government, with the government, with the Syrian army and the government. 80% of the Syrian population moves towards the territory held by, the, by their own government. The entire design of the Turkish design failed even at the time of Ailan Kurdi and again at the time of the Paris attack because you have a Paris attack, who did it, not did it, I'm not even going to it. But at least I know one thing, that terrorists do not carry passports when they go to carry and when they want to go to heaven. You don't need a, heaven, you don't need a passport to get to heaven. So why carry a passport? But the Syrian passport was that Syria is involved and then the Brits start bombing. In the last 15 days, the British have bombed in Syria only three times. They don't have targets to bomb actually, because they don't want to bomb ISIS. Their wires come for the videos with the guy. No, I think there's a sound problem. That guy is waiting. For, anyway, no problem. No problem. Okay. Now, uh, how do you end this ISIS story? It is very simple to end the ISIS story or the Al Qaeda or the Jabhat al Nusra and all that is that is happening. The camps are operating in Turkey and in Jordan mainly and in the Golan Heights controlled by Israel. You shut down the camps, you shut down the funding, shut down the weapon supply. And these guys will go back to the hundred countries that they came from. So one is to shut down the terror networks is a very simple task if they're really committed to the agenda. Where is the funding going from? The funding is going from the Saudis, Kuwaitis, Bahrain, Qatar. These are the main sources of funding. They say it is private finances, but these private finances are known to the government. It is being done by bank transfers from London to Turkey. It is all operating very openly. Okay. And Turkey is the main base for these operations. The other point is that are there solutions to the Syrian crisis or to the Iraq crisis? There are solutions to Yemen, to Libya, to all these places. But they cannot be resolved in the context of my Islam is the only way, or my sect is the only way, you cannot create a Shia Islamic state and expect Sunnis to accept a Shia Islamic state. You cannot create an Islamic Sunni state in Syria and expect the minorities in Syria to live as second class citizens because that is what the Mies finally are, protected citizens. It requires national projects. And what does it mean? In Iraq, where the Shias are 60% and the Kurds are 20% and the Arab Sunnis are 20%, you finally have to have a constitution which gives equal rights to all the citizens and to all the religions. There's no other way to do it. Okay? In Syria, 
And I, I, I'm ashamed of Muslims who say that Assad is an Alawite, how can he rule over a Sunni majority country? When I used to hear these statements, I used to tell them, by Manmohan Singh, our Pradhan Mantri, hai. tomorrow you want a Muslim to become a Prime Minister of this country. You cannot say that Assad is this sect and that religion, that is why he cannot become the Prime Minister or President of a country. Okay. The point is that, be it, what is the kind of support that Assad has in that country? Going through these three visits, even meeting the uh, Indian Embassy, because the Indian Embassy is one of the few functioning embassies in Damascus, most have got out of that place. We try to act as me and Jatin Desa, you know, we visited the Embassy twice and we said that after all this, who will vote for Assad? So the Indian Embassy, who are doing a lot of hard work over there, they said, listen, from our understanding, and we have been here through the entire course of the wars in 2011, 70 to 80 percent of the Syrian population is with the President. NATO quotes 70 percent. Al Jazeera quotes 56 percent way back in 2012. Okay. Now, how do you finally resolve Syria? This one must go, that one must go. Is that the way that the Americans want? Finally, we are saying hold elections. Let it be under United Nations auspices. Let there be United Nations observers and international observers and CNN Al Jazeera in every polling booth in that country, no problem at all. But let there be free and fair elections in Syria for people to decide who the leader will be, who the party will be, who the cabinet will be. There's no other way to do that entire thing. And in this cabinet of 15, apart from Assad, all the rest of, of, of them are Sunnis. In fact, the tragedy is there is no Christian leader in that entire thing. 80 to 85 percent of the Syrian army is Sunni. If if it was only a matter of the strength of the army on which Assad was standing and not the party, the army would have moved out, Assad would have collapsed within two weeks. It's been five years now. 2011, March, since the entire crisis started. My own Christian friends have told me, because the Christians are facing an ethnic cleansing from Iraq to Syria to all over the region. They are in a rural crisis. And they've been abandoned by the West. Today it is the Russian Orthodox Church, Russia, and Putin that are standing by the Christians of the East. They've given up on France, they've given up on the Vatican. Now what do my Christian friends tell me? That basically Assad has a solid block of 60% of support. The 30% who oppose him are the, basically the forces that support parliamentary reform in Syria. And there are a 10% group of extremist Islamists who are opposed to Assad for whatever reason. But 90% they say is now totally opposed to what is happening uh, in terms of the, you know, the international war that has been imposed on, on Syria. And it is, it is not a civil war. It, it was basically, and it is, an externally imposed war on Syria. Because even the first Arab League Committee report way back in 2011 and uh, April, there was an Arab League Committee that went into Syria to find out the solution. The Arab League Committee said that if this country heads for a war, because the militants have weapons, the government has weapons, this war in Syria will ruin the entire world. It requires a political solution. The Qataris and the Saudis dumped that into the garbage bin because they thought they could do a Libya and Syria. Uh, now, why did the Russians come in and what's actually happening? And what about the Indian situation? Why do Modi and Nawaz Sharif actually meet in Ufa and then again in, uh, in, in Islamabad? The Russians are there for a very clear reason. The Chinese are backing them for a very clear reason. The Russians know that they made a big mess when they did not veto the American role in Libya. Now, why did that not happen? Because there is, within Russia, there, is, there are two camps operating. It's not that Putin is the whole and sole leader of Russia. He does appear so, but that is not the entire reality. There are two camps within Russia. One is the Putin-led camp, which handles the security and stands for, the, for a nationalist Russia. And the other is the Medvedev camp, which actually controls the central bank and the financial institutions of Russia. So one is the Putin camp called the Eurasian Integrationist camp. What is the Eurasian Integrationist camp? Eurasia and Asia. That is why Putin talks of a Eurasian Union. And the other is the Anglo-Zionist American camp of Medvedev, which controls the financial structures of, uh, of, of Russia. So these actually camps are also battling it in within Russia. So why does Putin, into, Putin enter into, uh, into Syria? The reality was that in 
Till 2014, the Syrian army was beginning to win the war. But 2015, January onwards, again, the tide began to change because the Turkish army and other elements were actually involved. And the, Syrian are, the Syrians are a small country, it's only 23 million, you know, and, and their army could not actually deal with the kind of uh, what they were facing. So in the north, in Idlib, in Aleppo, the kind of flow that was coming, they had to stop the flow. The Turkish Air Force was active, ensuring cover to uh, the militants who were flowing in from Turkey. The Syrian Air Force actually could not even operate in the north. In the south, you would have the Israelis actually providing aerial protection to the, to the militants. And the Israelis have bombed Damascus more than six times, at the least, in the last three years, attacking Hezbollah, attacking other forces in Syria who are fighting the ISIS. Russia understood that if they did not bury the ISIS in Syria, then these flames were going to come into Dagestan, into Chechnya, into Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and China, Xinjiang, and finally into Afghanistan, Pakistan, into Kashmir. The ISIS had to be buried in Syria and in Iraq. That is why the Russians have gone in. But the Russians are not making that error of Afghanistan. They are not going to put in ground troops. The Syrian army, the Hezbollah, Iran is also active, Iraq is active. It's actually, Syria has become an international battlefield. All kinds of forces are active in Syria. But, but the Russians have lost that one pilot uh, due to Turkish perfidy, but the Turks are paying for it. Uh, that's one element. Uh, the, the Russian role has begun to change the entire tide of the battle in Syria. And along with it, the global geopolitical balance is also changing in favor of the East, where NATO and the Western powers are on the decline militarily, politically, and economically. That is how important the battle of uh, uh, Syria is. The other important element here is the Kurdish question. The Syrian Kurds, who actually came into Syria post World War I and II, when the Ottoman Empire, there was a, the first uh, genocide of the 20th century was actually the Armenian genocide. 1.5 million Armenians were massacred by the Ottoman Empire. Not many Muslims know about that. Not many want to discuss about that. But a lot of them were killed, a lot of them were crucified. All that has happened. The Kurds, the Alawites, even other sections, Lebanese, Sunnis, a lot of Arabs have also faced a uh, lot of that, uh, you know, destruction during World War I and afterwards. So this little community of the Kurds in Syria has stood strongly and has been able to de defeat the ISIS in, in the north. The Kurds, the Turks don't want that to happen. And that is why they are attacking the, the, the Kurdish po population to in uh, Syria and also in... Okay, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, okay, I'm done here. I just want to show the videos now, okay? So, I think uh, we'll do, uh, so these videos are very nice, short two, three minute videos. I want you all to run through them and then we'll come back to, I think we'll open it up for discussion. This is also, you know, everybody's against the ISIS. So what is actually happening? No, no. Desktop, desktop, okay, well, it's fine. Your agency was saying, quote, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the yeah. US was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups. Why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of, quote, unquote, yeah, Islamic extremism? I mean, I hate to say it's not my job, but that, my job was to, was to ensure that the, that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was, was as good as it could be. And I will tell you, it, it goes before 2012. I mean. When we, were, when we were in Iraq, and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of Iraq in 2011. I mean, it was very clear what we, what we were going to face. Well, I admire your frankness very on this subject. Very clear what we were going to let face. Me, let me just, to, one, before we move on, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis, sure. and you were arguing against it, but who wasn't listening? I think the, I think the administration. The administration turned a blind eye to your analysis. I don't know the, if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al-Qaeda, well, and Muslim Brotherhood. Well, a willful decision to do what they're doing, which, which you have to, really, you'd have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the, with the uh, policy that is in place? Because it is very, very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Matty, and I, don't, I can't tell you exactly what that is. And I've been at this for a long time. Words are because of willful decision. Okay. 
about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The truth is about the Middle East is, had there been no oil there? It's not a secret that Israel wants Assad fall to break down the Iranian Hezbollah Syrian axis, the biggest threat to Israel. Israel has struck Syria several times since the start of the crisis. It downed a Syrian jet fighter over the occupied Golan Heights, which was tracking the rebels led by al-Nusra. This morning, a Syrian aircraft infiltrated Israel's airspace. Um, our defense capabilities, our Patriot Air Force uh, defense mechanism, intercepted the aircraft, um, and we are currently reviewing the incident. Such attack raises more questions about the Israeli involvement in the Syrian conflict. Indeed, it has been well known that Israel has been providing medical care to the rebels who get injured during the fight with the Syrian army in the Israeli hospitals, where perhaps some will return to carry on the fight. <laughs> At the same time, ONDOF reports show that IDF Syrian rebels' interactions were not limited to medical care. Israeli forces were seen handing two boxes to them on the Israeli-Syrian line of the occupied Golan Heights. <laughs> The reports do not distinguish various Syrian militants groups fighting against the Syrian army, despite al qunaitira was reported to be controlled by al-Nusra Front. It seems that Israel seeks to make al qunaitira a buffer zone. However, Israel this time uses the extremist Islamist groups not only to keep the Syrian army distant, but also to fight in the name of jihad. M. Abbas, MEC. And on top of that, I am concerned about this report about Syrian rebels and the ceasefire with ISIS. Uh, Senator but that's Paul, not true. Well, it's not true. Uh, it's not true. The, uh, Whether, I don't care about the report. I know these people intimately. We talk to them all the time. But also let me point out that um, if we are going to conduct a conflict the way you are describing it is, and I'm afraid that's the case. This is reminiscent of Vietnam, the gradual escalation that ended up in one of the worst defeats that America has ever suffered. Let me ask you about what your colleague Rand Paul said about it this morning. He said, it's a mistake to arm them. Most of the arms that we've given the so-called moderate rebels have wound up in the hands of ISIS because ISIS simply takes it from them or it is given to them and we mistakenly actually um, end up giving it to some radicals. How, how, 
Look, things has are Rand very... Paul, has Rand Paul ever been to Syria? Has he ever met with I, ISIS? Has I, I, he I'm ever met with, with fight, any of these Senator. people? No, no, no. I, we're going to have a fight because it's patently false. This is the same Rand Paul that said we didn't want to have anything to do with, with anything to do in the Middle East, by the way. I don't want to get in a fight with him at all. Yeah. But it's not true. I know these people. I'm in contact with them all the time. All right, let me and ask he is you this. Not. These are the oil tankers operating that are taking the oil from Iraq and Syria into Turkey. Kilometers and kilometers of oil tankers are there. Sumit, gone. He's not, not there. As the Western country's campaign against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad continues, I went undercover inside Turkey to get to the bottom of the crisis and to find out how Turkey contributes to the problems inside Syria. In this edition of In Focus, we set out for an investigative mission in Turkey to uncover Turkey's pivotal role in Syria's insurgency. Turkish government has been a key player for Western countries to execute their plots against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Turkey made it happen by opening its borders with Syria to the anti-Bashar militant groups, widely known in the West as the Free Syrian Army. It has not only funded the militants, but it has also supplied them with weapons and equipment inside its territory before entering Syria. In this edition of In Focus, we set out for an investigative mission in Turkey to uncover Turkey's pivotal role in Syria's insurgency. Early last year, when the conflict initially began between government forces and foreign-backed militants, calling themselves the Free Syrian Army, Turkey furtively allowed its borders to be taken over by anti-Assad forces. The only current border legally controlled by the Syrian army is that of Ladiye. The borders remain unpatrolled as foreign-backed militants import and export weapons freely. As I was able to approach one of the border crossings named Bab al Hawa, I encountered an estimated 300 semi-trucks on the border awaiting militants to empty them out. In order to enable swift arms transfer, militants on the Syrian side of the border are now using their own passport stamp. I spoke with several militants who stated that if they were to see a legal stamp from the Syrian government, they would most likely kill the person carrying it. Turkey's 
من شمال من المغرب من قرم طرف اي نعم هون موجودين بيجوا بينزل بالمطار او بيجي بالباص بينزل بمطاكي بيرتاح له بيستريح يومين ثلاثه وبعدها بيروح من هون على الحرم بيروح ليالا داق او لالتونوس دفعوا لهم كلهم مصاري ما يدفعوا لهم ما يعطون شهريات ما يعطون مصاري ما يقولون لهم على الجهات ما يقولون هون جهات هم محل The American air base located inside Turkey, Inkerlik, has been of strategic importance to the disturbance because it has enabled the Turkish government to facilitate the movement of arms without facing public scrutiny. The base is located eight kilometers east of the Turkish city of Adana. Sources say when weaponry arrives, it is given to two American and one Mexican men. We either distribute them among refugee camps or across the border into Syria. Turkish military officials ensure the weapons are transferred swiftly and discreetly to Syria. President Bashar al-Assad has blamed the Turkish government specifically for the uproar inside Syria, while media reports have revealed that terrorists received Israeli weapons via Turkey. They were loaded up on three Israeli planes. Meanwhile, the funds needed for the purpose have been provided by Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Syria's foreign ministry in a letter to the United Nations blamed Turkey along with Qatar and Saudi Arabia for sponsoring terrorists inside Syria. Syria's state TV blamed Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan for a powerful blast that reached the Syrian city of Aleppo just across the Turkish border. The West is against me. Many Arab countries, including Turkey, which is not Arab, of course, against me. And if the people, if the Syrian people are against me, how can I be here? You should focus on external enemy, mm -hmm. not internal enemy. Even if you have internal enemy like terrorism, uh, you have society that could help you at least not to uh, provide the terrorists with incubator. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's a new kind. We have a new kind of war, terrorism through proxies either Syrians mm -hmm. living in Syria or foreigner fighters coming from abroad. So it's a new style of war. This is first. So you have to adapt with this new style. It takes time. It's not easy. Okay. And to say this is easy, as easy as a normal or, let's say, traditional or regular war, no. It's much more difficult. Second, the support that they've been had, that's been offered to those terrorists in every aspect, armaments, money, political, is unprecedented. So you have to expect that it's going to be tough war and difficult war. You don't say it, you don't expect a small country like Syria to defeat all those countries that have been fighting us through proxies just in days or weeks. This is Erdogan. I think he believes that if Muslim Brotherhood take over in the region and especially in Syria, he can guarantee his political future. This is one reason. The other reason Personally, he thinks that he's the new sultan of the Ottoman, and he can control the region as it was during the Ottoman Empire under a different, let's say, umbrella, which is the Islamic, but not the Ottoman Empire, not to be Khalifa. Press. I say, I'm going to the door. I say, I'm going to the door. How do you say it? ما يدربوا بس تخربوا هزور إيش بسمو هونيك يعني الراحة تخربوها. Camps have been put up throughout Turkey for the purpose of sheltering over 120,000 refugees in the crossfire between foreign-backed militants and Syrian government forces. This lady told me the Turkish government is good with them. However, prices have raised extremely since they arrived. We are supposed to get aid, she said, but they come once and then never again. Every time we ask for aid, they disgrace us. So we go once and then never again. They have the aid, but it's very hard to get. We need aid because prices are outrageous. Bread alone has been raised to 400 Syrian lira. This man said the camps are up to standards and that there is proper food and medical care and that the only thing he's missing is to go back to his country.
This refugee had the same tone while saying he is happy at the camps and feels at home, but still longs to go back to Syria. While others are camps set up as training facilities for the rebels. My attempt to enter the camp was unsuccessful as it is heavily guarded by Turkish military. We were, however, able to shoot video of the camps from afar as guards at the door warned of snipers in the watchtowers ahead. The camp that holds some turned insurgent former Syrian army generals is in the Turkish town of Apaiden. My producer was able to get a hold of one of the generals living inside the camp. After a relationship was established with money involved, he offered to give us pictures of the weapons inside, thus admitting that the camps are not for civilian refugees, exactly what they've been trying to conceal from the public. A Turkish journalist was able to discover one of the hidden military camps in the Turkish city of Chakoli. The Chakoli camp alone holds 7,500 armed men. A Turkish journalist from the Yunus Daily newspaper was the first person to uncover the hidden military camps in between the mountains in what seemed to be a small forest. This particular camp lays right on the border of Syria and Turkey. So when the story was reported, the militants were quick to take their weapons and place them one meter inside Syria. I went to visit Turkish journalist Omar Demis to get information on his findings. Türkiye'nin tedarikçiliğiyle e, sağlandığı, ancak tam olarak nereden geldiğini, e, ancak e, bir, bir, bir, bir tanık bir, bir, biriyle görüşmüştüm ben. E, e, Libya'dan geldiği söylenen, e, Kreşinkov'a benzeyen ama Kreşinkov olmayan, e, e, İranlı, e, şey, pardon, Iraklı, Irak'ta savaşan bir Libya, Afganistan'da savaşanlar, Libya'da savaşanlar, bunların tümünden Somali'de, Sudanlı dahil olmak üzere radikal İslamcı, cihatçı, öbek öbek geliyor Türkiye'ye. Çerkezler dahil olmak üzere var işte. Türkiye'yle el kaideciler var. Upon arrival, Mr. Demis had informed me he had over 20 warrants for his arrest, one of them being a 10-year jail sentence for speaking out against the Turkish government. Mr. Demis was also able to supply me with pictures of some of the insurgents inside the camps. The pictures revealed that not all of the insurgents fighting in this so-called Syrian uprising are Syrian, but in fact, mercenaries from various countries sent into Syria via Turkey. نحن ما بدنا حرب ما بدنا حرب أبديا شاب مبسوط يعني مالنا ومال الحرب نحن أي دولة حاربت ونفع الحرب دمر الولاد الأطفال والنساء والمظلومين مين استفاد دولة واحدة أمريكا Certain nationals from different countries, most notably Saudi Arabia, Africa, Afghanistan, Libya and Morocco are entering Turkey without question they are then escorted by Turkish military officials to the border region to join the insurgent militants, either in Syria or in the refugee camps. Local residents are now filled with dissent as armed insurgents have moved out of border towns into the cities where crimes such as theft have recently risen. Store owners informed me insurgents would openly and freely steal from their shops. Restaurant owners also complained of insurgents ignoring to pick up the bill. When asked for money, they would say they were guests of the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan. علشان وطبعا علشان ما يصير نحن عندنا مشاكل نحن ما بدنا مشاكل بس كل يعني كل نريده نحن نحن مشاكل ما بدنا بس الدولة هون عم تشجعون 
The Hatay province, which is known for its wide religious diversity, was taken by surprise when insurgents tried to infiltrate their quiet, peaceful town. Residents say they carried weapons and didn't look like your ordinary civilians, let alone refugees, but rather militants trying to cause a sectarian conflict. The residents of Hatay stood side by side to push back the insurgents by conducting demonstrations. Actually, this was a documentary by Serena Shem. Uh, we are talking of, it's a 20-minute documentary. It says a lot of things. Anyway, I'll end it here. I think Surinji will say a few words. And if you have time, we can have a little discussion around.